Good morning. Welcome to Garner Evangelical Free Church on this beautiful sunny morning. If you're listening in the car this morning, we are on 88.1 FM if you'd like to tune in there. As we begin, I, I want to read a call to worship from Isaiah chapter 12. 700 years before the coming of Christ, the prophet Isaiah looked ahead to the day of salvation. And the day of salvation has already dawned with the coming of Jesus Christ and especially with his death and resurrection. And so let's just hear this call to worship from Isaiah chapter 12. You will say in that day, that is in the day of salvation, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. And so that's what we're here to do this morning, to, to sing praise to the Lord, to give thanks to him, to, to call upon his name, to make known his deeds, and, and proclaim that his name is exalted. So I want to welcome you this morning to worship here at Garner Evangelical Free Church. Just a few announcements as we get started. First of all, I just want to thank everyone who helped with Larry Bates's funeral on Friday morning. It was just so great to see uh, so many people from the church family helping uh, and blessing the Bates family in that way. Thank you to Don for all that you did with running the sound. Thanks to those who helped with setup and with teardown and with providing refreshments for the family. And so uh, let's keep Sharon and the whole Bates family in our, in our prayers in the coming days, in the coming weeks, um, as they go through this time of, of sorrow and, and um, as they're missing Larry. We're all missing Larry, our, our dear brother in the Lord. So let's just keep praying for one another and especially for, for Sharon and her family. It's hard to believe that it's already August, isn't it? <laughs> As we look ahead to September and to this fall, one thing that I, that I would love to do this fall is to equip you for evangelism. The, the Bible study that I'm holding right here is called Uncovering the Life of Jesus. And it's got six lessons from the Gospel of Luke. And it's, it's really a great study. It's by, it's by Becky Pippert, um, who, who's done a lot of good writing about evangelism. And it's intended to be used with non-believers as a way of introducing them to what the Bible says about Jesus and inviting them to come to follow Christ. And so what I'd like to do this fall is to go through this study with, with a group of people from our church family, who, whoever's interested. And then after we go through it, then you can take it and use it to reach out to your friends. You can use it in a one-on-one -on -one setting. You and your spouse can do it with another couple. You can invite your whole neighborhood, have 10 or 12 people come and go through the study with you. So um, if you're interested in that, um, I, I would love to include you in that, that six-week study this fall. So I'll send out an email this week with more details of that. Um, that's just a way that, that, that we can um, grow in our uh, skills and our gifts uh, for sharing the gospel. As we continue to work together as a church to face the challenges of COVID-19, the elders recognize that you may have questions for us, you may desire to provide input. And so with that in mind, we want to give you an invitation. This week we're planning to have some online meetings via Zoom on Monday and Wednesday and Thursday nights from 7 to 8 p.m. We're going to intentionally keep those meetings small with a maximum of five families in each one so that everyone has an opportunity to ask their questions and to dialogue. There's a link in the emails that I send out on Thursday and Friday, and I'll send out another email today. And if you click on that link, you can sign up for any one of those meetings if you're interested. As, as we navigate COVID together as a church, we as elders recognize that just about everybody has COVID fatigue, right? <laughs> I mean, we've all been going through this for, for, for four and a half months. This, this is a hard season. We empathize with that. Just about everything in life is abnormal right now, and, and, and we understand. We would love it if everything could get back to normal. And within the church, of course, there are different perspectives, different opinions on, 
how we should be navigating this season. And it's not just in this church, but it's everywhere. This week I was talking with our Evangelical Free Church uh, Central District Church Health Director. And he said, Haddon, there, there are 135 churches in this district, and there's not a single one where everybody is happy. And he said that this is nationwide, too. He's involved in several nationwide networks. He said this is the case everywhere. Almost no one in any church anywhere is completely happy with their church, with, with their church situation during COVID. And the church in America is really struggling right now to, to try to stay together and to be unified and to be at peace. And it's important for us here, just like it's important for every church, to stay unified and to be at peace. Because the reality is that the world is watching. Those outside of God's kingdom are, are watching. And we want to be able to show the world that God's church can be unified and that we can pull together, even at a time like this, for the glory of God. Ephesians 4.3 says, Maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's really the challenge before us in these days. And so how do, we, how do we do that? Well, the Bible teaches us how to pursue peace with one another. I just want to point out one passage uh, right now. This is Jesus speaking in Matthew 5, 23 and 24. He says, So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. And so Jesus says, go and have a, have a personal conversation with your brother as soon as possible so that you can work things out and be, and be reconciled. Jesus doesn't tell us to get lots of people involved. He, he just says, go to your brother and be reconciled to him. And so that's what we're aiming to do with the Zoom meetings this week. All of the elders have set aside three evenings this week for these small meetings where everyone will get a chance to talk, to ask questions, to dialogue together. If you have frustrations that you'd like to bring to us, please come. We, we, we want to listen. We want to hear you. If you don't have frustrations, but just have questions or, or concerns, please come. We would love to talk with you. If you just want to hear more about what's going on or provide observations or encouragements, you're welcome to come. We just want to make it clear that everyone in the church family is, is welcome to participate in one of the Zoom meetings this week on Monday, Wednesday, or Thursday night from 7 to 8 p.m. And if they, get all, if they all get filled up, then we can schedule more next week. And I, I'd love to, to even just call us to pray that God would help us to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace for the sake of his kingdom. I think it would be great if all of us could make this week a week of special focused prayer for, for God to work in our church and to work in our hearts and to work in his church really throughout the whole nation to bring peace and unity in Christ. And let's pursue that peace in the way that Jesus has taught us to in his word. Our missionaries of the month for August now are Ken and Deb Quintus. Um, they would love to, for us to be praying that what the enemy has meant for evil, that God will use it for good for those who are greatly struggling in their addiction with alcohol, abuse, and drugs. So I just love the ministry that Ken and Deb, Ken and Deb have. Um, bringing the gospel to people who desperately need Jesus and helping them out of addictions, helping them to to follow Jesus Christ and find their joy in him. And so let's just be praying that through Ken's ministry this week that the Lord would work in the hearts of people and help them to follow Jesus and, and to put behind the past. So with that in mind, let's just join our hearts together right now in prayer. Father in heaven, we do lift up Ken and Deb to you and we're so thankful to you for them, for their hearts, for their ministry. Lord, thank you that you are using them to reach people who are in desperate need of the hope of the gospel. And so, Lord, would you continue to work through them and, and work mightily in the power of your Spirit so that through Ken and Deb's ministry, people would be set free from addictions, that they would be set free from the guilt and shame of the past, that they'd be set fr free from, from drugs and alcohol and other addictions, and that they would come to find their hope and their peace and their joy in your Son, Jesus Christ. And so would you strengthen Ken and Deb? And would you open up the hearts of those that they're ministering to? And Lord, we know that you have done many miracles in people's lives through their ministry over the years. And we ask that that would just continue and increase, Lord. Father, we pray this morning for, for Sharon and for her family. And we ask that you would comfort them. Lord, would you give them just such peace and hope 
in the midst of this season. We ask that you would just be powerfully present in each one of their lives, Lord, and that they would be able, as they grieve, that they would be able to, to rest in the hope that we have. Lord, we're so thankful for our brother Larry. Thank you that we know he's with you and that he's pain-free and that he's enjoying being in your presence now, Lord. And so, Lord, would you minister your comfort to Sharon, to her family, and to all of us, Lord, as we miss our dear brother Larry. Lord, we pray that you would help us to reach our community with the good news of salvation in Christ. Lord, we all have so many opportunities to reach people and to share with them the good news and the hope of salvation that's found in Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to take those opportunities and that you would open up doors more and more and more and that through our witness that many people would come to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Lord, I ask that you might even use this, this study uh, through the Gospel of Luke to equip us and to use us, Lord, to share the gospel with our friends, with our neighbors, with our family. And so, Lord, just use us here in Garner to be a lighthouse for the gospel and to spread the good news to those around us. And so, Lord, as we continue to worship you this morning, we ask that your name would be glorified. We love you, we need you, and we're so thankful, most of all, for the gift of your Son, Jesus, and the eternal life we have in him. We pray it in his precious name. Amen. Our fighter verse for this week is Psalm 34, verses 15 and 16. And it says, The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to, cu to cut off the memory of them from the earth. And so what, a, what, a, what an encouragement, that the eyes of the Lord are toward his people. His ears are open to our cries. And so we can cry out to the Lord knowing that he hears us and that he loves us and he listens to us. Right now we're going to um, turn to 1 John chapter 1. Our scripture for the message this morning is 1 John 1, 8 through chapter 2, verse 2. The Apostle John writes to us, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Let's pray together once more. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful that you came into this world to die for our sins. We're so thankful that though we are sinners, we have hope in you. Thank you that, that you are overflowing with grace toward us. And so, Lord, I pray that as we look into your word this morning, and as we think about the, the sin in our lives and what to do with it, Lord, I pray that you would overwhelm us with your grace. I pray that we would see more and more clearly what a merciful and loving God that you are so that our hearts would rejoice in you and that we would rest in the peace of knowing that you are for us and not against us and that we are clean and forgiven in your sight. And so, Lord, would you speak to us now through your holy word? And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. That's what John tells us in verse 5 of chapter 1. And it's, and it's what we focused on last Sunday morning. This is the central message of 1 John, the foundation for the rest of the letter. The truth of who God is is the foundation for everything in this book. And the truth is that God is light. In him is no darkness at all. And last week we learned that that means, first of all, that God is perfectly good. God is perfectly holy. And this also means that God reveals himself to us. Just like it's the nature of light to shine, it's the nature of God to reveal himself so that we can know him, so we can have fellowship with him, so that we can walk in his ways. And since God is light, all of us as his people are called to walk in the light. And when we do that, when we walk in the light, we enjoy fellowship with God. Back in verse 3 of chapter 1, it says, Our fellowship is with the Father, and with his son, Jesus Christ. And we also enjoy fellowship with one another as we walk in the light. 
Verse 7 says, If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And so we enjoy wonderful blessings when we're walking in the light. But we all know in our hearts that we don't always walk in the light, do we? In fact, the pure, bright light of God exposes the darkness in us. And that's a problem for us, isn't it? The first chapter of this letter brings us face to face with a, with a really big problem. Let me put it this way. How can sinful people, like you and me, live in fellowship with a holy God? To be more specific about this, as Christians, what do we do with the sin in our lives? That's really the question before us here in 1 John 1. As believers, what do we do with the sin in our lives? We all know that we sin every single day. And so what do we do with that sin? How do, how do we still walk in close fellowship with God? This is a really important question because we want to live in fellowship with God, don't we? This is what life is all about. There's no greater joy. This is what we were created for, to walk in fellowship with God. And our sin, of course, gets, the way in, get, gets in the way of that. God, God always loves us. He's like the sunshine. It's constant. It, the, the, the sun, 93 million miles away, never stops burning. But you know what? Sometimes the clouds come and they block the light of the sun. And that's kind of what our sin does, isn't it? It, it, it blocks us from receiving the light of God's face and from enjoying his love and enjoying the fellowship with him that we're meant to have. And so, how do sinful Christians like you and me walk in the light and experience fellowship with God? Well, to begin with, verse 8 tells us how to not deal with our sin. <laughs> before, it, before John gives us the answer, he tells us, here's what not to do. He says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Remember that John is writing this letter to Christians. He's not preaching an angry message to unbelievers, telling them that they're a bunch of heathen sinners. No, John is speaking to Christians here. And he's saying we all have sin in our lives, no matter how mature we might be. And I want you to notice that John is actually including himself in this. He's, he's not saying, well, if you have, say that you have no sin, you're deceiving yourself. No, he says, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. He's saying, all of us, myself included, have sin in our lives. Remember, this is Jesus' beloved disciple. He's probably a very old man at this point as he's writing this letter. He's one of the most godly Christians who's ever walked the face of the earth. And he's admitting, if I say that I have no sin, I'm deceiving myself. I also want you to notice that he's not saying, if we say we have no sin, then we have been deceived. Satan has deceived us. No, he's saying, we're deceiving ourselves if we believe that we have no sin. If I think that I have no sin in my life, then I've lied to myself. I've somehow managed to convince myself of something that's obviously not true. One more thing. He, he says, if we, deny our, if, we do, if we deny our sin, he says, the truth is not in us. The truth isn't in us. The Bible is very clear about this truth. Jesus Christ is the only perfect person who ever walked the earth. Even the most mature Christians struggle with sin day by day. Just like John himself. Or if you just read Romans 7, you see how the Apostle Paul struggled and he fought against sin all of his life. Verse 10 basically says the same thing. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. John is saying there, if we claim that we've not sinned, then we're saying the Bible isn't true. The word of God is not true. The Bible says that we're all sinners, but I'm the exception. <laughs> If we do that, it means that we're essentially calling God a liar. Now, sometimes as Christians, we don't deny that we have sin in our lives. We're aware of that fact, but we simply don't care, right? <laughs> we get comfortable with certain sins in our lives, and we settle into complacency. I would guess that for many Christians, the problem is not that we deny our sin, but that we get apathetic about it. We simply don't care, and we ignore it. And then on the other side, sometimes Christians live in guilt and shame because they are aware of their sin, but it's, but it's a constant burden to them. And they try to be really good in order to keep God happy with them. 
especially after they feel like they've fallen into some really big sin. H- have you ever done this? I know that I have. Something that really bothers your conscience. You just try to be really, really good for a few days to get back into God's good graces, to get, go- to get God to like you again. Really, that's nothing more than self-righteousness, isn't it? And it's a very discouraging way to live. I know, I, I've been there. We can never be good enough. And so, do you find yourself in any of those positions? Either denying your sin, or simply not caring about it, or trying to make up for it by being self-righteous. None of those is a good way to deal with our sin. And so, so, so the question remains, how should we deal with the sin in our lives? How can Christians who sin every day actually walk in the light and keep walking in fellowship with God? The answer is found in verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What we need to do, very simply, is to confess our sins, to confess them to the Lord. David did this in Psalm 32, verse 5. He said, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now, confession of sin involves two main things. First of all, it involves simply admitting the truth, acknowledging our sin. Instead of denying our sin, we need to own up to it. And then secondly, confession involves taking God's side against our sin. It's interesting that when you look at John's writings, you see that the act of confession involves taking God's side instead of taking the side of his enemies. Let me give you one example of this. In John 12, 42, the Gospel of John, it says, Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, that is, they believed in Jesus, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. Think about that. On the one side, you've got Jesus. And on the other side, you've got the Pharisees. And if these people who are starting to believe in Jesus, if they actually confess him, if they confess him to be the Son of God, they're going to be taking Jesus aside. And the Pharisees are going to see that, and they're going to say, you're not on our side anymore. We're kicking you out of the synagogue. But they don't want to do that. (laughs) And so they're trying to straddle the fence. They're trying to be in the middle. They, They don't want to get the Pharisees upset with them. And so for them to confess Jesus would mean that they're saying, I'm taking Jesus' side instead of the Pharisees' side. And so, if confessing Jesus involves taking his side instead of the side of his enemies, then whose side are we taking when we confess our sins? Well, we're taking God's side. God and sin are enemies. And when we confess our sin, we're saying, sin is my enemy too. I am taking God's side in the war against my own sin. In other words, confessing our sin involves repentance. It involves turning away from our sin. You don't just say, well, yes, Lord, I admit that I've sinned, but I don't really care. (laughs) I'm just going to keep on doing it. No, what you're saying is, Lord, I admit that I've sinned, and what I want to do is fight against my sin. I want to make war on it. I want to stop it, and I want to live in obedience to you instead. And so that's what we're called to do with our sin. And when we do that, according to verse 9, God does two things. Two specific things. He does something to the sin, and he does something to us. First of all, what God does to the sin is that he forgives it. The idea of forgiveness means that God gets rid of our sin. He makes it leave. He makes it depart from us. It's interesting, again, when you look at John's writings, and the word here that's translated forgive, usually... Uh, in the Gospel of John and in 1 John, it's translated leave, like, some, some, like certain people left or Jesus left a certain place. That's what's happening when God forgives our sin. He's making it leave. He's making it go away from us, removing it. Isn't that a wonderful thought? God himself reaches down and he removes our sin from us and he completely takes it away. It's the same thought that you find in Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. You, see, you find the same idea in Micah seven nineteen. 
It says, you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. It's like God takes our sins and he buries them in the bottom of the ocean, never to be seen again. And so when we confess our sins, God forgives them, removes them, buries them. And then he also does something to us. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Sin makes us dirty. It defiles us. It makes us unclean. And that's a problem that only God can solve. I, I think we all feel this, don't we? When you, when you do something that you know you shouldn't have done, maybe, maybe you lose your temper, or maybe you say something that you know you shouldn't have said, you feel dirty, don't you? you al- it's almost like you, need, you, you feel like you need to, to take a shower and just scrub away the filth. But you can't scrub off your guilt. You need to be cleansed, and only God can do that. And the good news of verse 9 is that when we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. God makes you clean. He, he washes away the guilt and, and the shame. And in the eyes of God, the only eyes that really matter, you are completely clean. Again, remember when David uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba. And he finally came to that point where he confessed his sin. He wrote in Psalm 51, 7, Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Wash me, Lord, and I'll be whiter than snow. Maybe you came here this morning carrying a, a burden of guilt and feeling dirty and defiled by sin. Confess it to the Lord, and he will wash you whiter than snow. And as it says here in verse 9, God does this because he is faithful and just. God is faithful to keep his promises to forgive our sins and wash us clean. And God is just in doing so. We're going to talk about this more in a little bit. But because of Christ's death on the cross, it is just and right for God to cleanse us from our sin. Our sin has already been punished on the cross. When you think of justice, you usually think of punishment, don't you? And the punishment on our sin has already been, ca- been carried out. It was carried out 2,000 years ago. God will not put us in double jeopardy. Our sin has already been paid for, and so it is just for God to forgive us and wash us clean. And so this is how sinful Christians like you and me can walk in fellowship with the Holy God. We confess our sin, we admit it, we turn away from it, and by faith we receive the forgiveness and cleansing that God freely gives to us. And this is not something that we, that we do when we first, only when we first become Christians. This is meant to be a part of our normal lives, part of our daily walk with God. In verse 9, the word confess is in the present tense. That means it's not something that you just do once and then it's done. No, it's, it's meant to be an ongoing part of our daily walk with Christ. And if you think about it, this is exactly what Jesus taught us, isn't it? He taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Think about that. Every day, we ask God to provide for our needs, to provide our daily bread. And so it makes sense that every day, we ask God to forgive us our debts and we receive his forgiveness by faith. This is just part of our daily walk with Christ. Now you might wonder, why do we need to do this when we're already Christians. I mean, when you first trust in Jesus, he he forgives you of all of your sin once and for all, right? Well, yes, that's true. He does. And so why do we need to confess our sins to God if he has already forgiven all of our sins from the past, the present, the future? Well, just think about the relationship between a parent and a child. When your children sin against you, of course you still love them. Of course, you're not going to hold their sin over their head in a vindictive way. But as long as they're not willing to confess their sin and, and, and turn away from it, there's a strain on the relationship, isn't there? But when the child confesses the sin and asks for forgiveness, the relationship is restored. And when you forgive the child, it's like the sin is taken away. It's like it, it had never even happened. Really, it's the same way in marriage, isn't it? When one spouse offends the other, there is a strain on the, re- on the relationship. 
yes, you still love one another. The marriage isn't over, but, but there's a tension between the husband and wife. But when the sin is confessed and it's forgiven, then there's restoration. Then the relationship can, can be close again. In the same way, when we sin as Christians, we don't stop being God's children. He's still our Heavenly Father who loves us. And we're still part of the bride of Christ. Christ is still married to us. God doesn't stop loving us. He doesn't hold our sin over our heads in a vindictive way. But if we persist in unconfessed sin, there's a strain on the relationship. We miss out on the close fellowship with God that he wants us to enjoy. But when we confess our sins, the strain in the relationship is gone. It's like the clouds blow away and we get to see the sunlight of his face again. We get to experience the joy of knowing the forgiveness of our Heavenly Father. And now we can enjoy close fellowship with God once again without anything hindering the relationship. We don't need to do deny our sin or try to hide it. We shouldn't ignore it. We shouldn't say, who cares? We don't need to live in guilt and, and try to make up for our mistakes. No, we can confess our sin with confidence that God is going to give us his grace and then we can keep walking in close fellowship with him. Now, why can we be so confident about this? Why can we approach God's throne with boldness to receive his mercy? In fact, we might have points in our lives when we say, well, I know, for, I know God is a forgiving God, but boy, I, I really messed up. I, I know God forgives me of, you know, stealing a cookie from the cookie jar or something little like that, but when you think about what I've done, will God even forgive me of this? Well, listen to what it says now in the first two verses of chapter 2. Verse 1, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus is our advocate. An advocate, of course, is a person who speaks up on behalf of someone else. That is exactly what Jesus does for us in heaven. He speaks up on our behalf. He pleads with the Father for mercy on our behalf. It's just like Paul wrote in Romans 8, 34. Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Isn't it wonderful that the Son of God is in heaven interceding for us, speaking up on our behalf? And so as long as Jesus is in heaven, we cannot be condemned. It's impossible for us to be condemned. As long as Jesus is our advocate, the Father will continue to forgive us and cleanse us from sin. As long as Jesus is speaking up on our behalf, we will be welcomed and accepted by a holy God. One of the songs that we often sing here, I think captures this so well. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me, can bid me thence depart. Unrighteous people like you and me need a righteous advocate to speak up on our behalf. And that is exactly what we have in Jesus. If anyone does, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous the perfect righteous advocate for us. And his intercession for us as our advocate is effective ultimately because of what he did for us on the cross. Verse 2 says, He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, what does it mean to say that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins? That's probably not a word that most of us use every day. <laughs> what does this mean? Well, we need to begin with the fact that God is hostile towards sin. God is light. In him is no darkness at all. And the light is opposed to the darkness. In other words, God hates sin because he's a good God. He's opposed to everything that's not good. And that means that apart from Christ, we stand under the wrath of God. We deserve God's righteous wrath because of our rebellion against him. But when Jesus died, this is what he did. He bore the wrath of God 
that we deserve for our sin. That's what it means to say that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. When Jesus died on the cross, all of God's righteous wrath was poured out upon Jesus. Praise God that he sent his son to drink the cup of his wrath on our behalf. This is why Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when you think of Jesus bearing the wrath of God, don't think of God as a, as a tyrant whose anger is out of control and Jesus just you know, manages to twist his arm by dying for us so that his anger will calm down. No, that's, that's not a biblical picture at all. Yes, God has righteous wrath against our sin, but whose idea was it to send Jesus to come and die for us? It was the Father's idea. Why did God send his Son to die as the propitiation bearing his wrath against our sin? It's because God loves us. 1 John 4.10 In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. I think you could say that the love of God overcame the wrath of God so that we could be reconciled to God. This is the best news in the world. God was angry with our sin, and rightly so, but he loves us so much that he gave his son to bear the wrath we deserved so that we could be forgiven and washed clean. I love the way that John Stott says this. He says, The, propit the Christian propitiation is an appeasement of the wrath of God by the love of God through the gift of God. That is through Jesus Christ. Right now, Jesus Christ is standing in heaven as our advocate. And he's not like any other advocate. He bore the judgment and the wrath we deserved. He paid for our sins once and for all. And now he speaks on our behalf to the Father. Forgive this one who belongs to me. Forgive him of even his most terrible sins. Forgive her of even the sins that she's most ashamed of. And as our Savior pleads for us, Will our loving God say no to his son? <laughs> How could God say no to his son, the righteous one? How could he say no to the, to the one who died for us? Since Jesus is our advocate and our propitiation, you and I can live in fellowship with God. Even though we sin every day, we can confess our sins with the confidence that God will forgive us. God will wash us clean. And that is how you and I can walk in close fellowship with a holy God. Charles Wesley, who was one of the greatest hymn writers in the history of the church, wrote a hymn back in the 18th century about Christ's work as our advocate before the Father. It's called, Arise, My Soul, Arise. And the final verse of that hymn says, My God is reconciled. His pardoning voice I hear. He owns me for his child. I can no longer fear. With confidence I now draw nigh. With confidence I now draw nigh. And Father, Abba, Father, cry. We can draw near to God and cry, Abba, Father, and live as his beloved children because our Savior died for us. And now he is pleading for us at the right hand of the Father. And so let's confess our sins to God. And let's take God's side against them. And let's rest in the assurance that we are clean, we are forgiven, we are accepted by God through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you are a gracious God. Thank you that even though your justice cries out for our sin to be punished, yet you in your love chose to send your Son to bear that punishment so that we could be forgiven so that we could know you, so that we could call you Abba, Father. And so, Lord, I pray for every one of us here that we might have the confidence every day to come before you, to confess our sins, and to receive that, that forgiveness and that washing that you offer to us in Christ. And that we would just live in the confidence every day, Lord, of knowing that you forgive us and that you accept us and that, and that we can live having a deep, close, personal relationship with you, all because of your son Jesus and what he's done for us. And so be glorified now as we sing your praises together. 
And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing together. And we're going to begin with, with Lord, I need you. Just confessing our need for God, our need for his grace and his forgiveness. And then as we move into the rest of the songs, we're going to exalt in the forgiveness and the grace that we've been given in Jesus Christ. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Lord, I come, and I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. So teach my song to rise to you. So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay Lord, I need you Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour I need my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. You're my one defense. You're my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. You're my one defense. You're my one defense. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Next, we're going to sing Jesus, only Jesus, who has the power to raise the dead, who can save us from our sin. He is our hope, our righteousness, Jesus, only Jesus. Who has the power to raise the dead? Who can save us from our sin? He is our hope, our righteousness. Jesus, only Jesus. And who can make the blind to see? Who holds the keys that set us free? He paid it all to bring us peace. Jesus, 
only Jesus. Holy King Almighty Lord. Holy King Almighty Lord. Saints and angels all adore. I join with them and bow before Jesus, only Jesus. Who can command the highest praise? Who can command the highest praise? Who has the name above all names? You stand alone, I stand amazed. Jesus, only Jesus. Holy King Almighty Lord. Holy King Almighty Lord, saints and angels all adore. I join with them and bow before Jesus, only Jesus. You will command. You will command the highest praise. Yours is the name above all names. You stand alone, I stand amazed. Jesus, only Jesus. Jesus, only Jesus. Holy King Almighty Lord. Holy King Almighty Lord, saints and angels all adore. I join with them and bow before Jesus, only Jesus. You will command the highest praise. You will command the highest praise. Yours is the name. Above all names, you stand alone. I stand amazed, Jesus, only Jesus. Jesus, only Jesus. Jesus, only Jesus. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. My all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. And bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand. 
till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand in romans 5 it says that where sin increased grace abounded all the more that's really the message of our passage in first john this morning isn't it where sin increased grace abounded all the more and that's what we're going to sing about in the la- this last song amazing grace my chains are gone you probably know the, the story of John Newton, the man who wrote this song. He's a slave trader, slave trader, responsible for bringing thousands and thousands of, of slaves from Africa to England and treated them brutally, and then God saved him. And out of the, his reflection on God's grace in his life, he, he wrote this wonderful song. Amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me i once was lost but now i'm found was blind but now i see twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour i first believed my chains are gone i've been set free my god my savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace the lord has promised good to me the lord has promised good to me his word my hope secures he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures my chains are gone my chains are gone i've been set free my god my savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace my chains are gone i've been set free my god my savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace the earth shall soon dissolve like snow the earth shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but god who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever mine you are forever mine let's go with god's blessing the grace of the lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you all Amen.